in your heart. If we were to look at uh, the context of Psalm 4610, that whole psalm, it speaks of that there is this peace offered, but it's in the midst of tribulation. It's in the midst of, uh, of natural disaster. It's in the midst of political upheaval. And yet God offers this command, this invitation to be still and know that he is God. In Psalm 46, verse 2 and 3, earlier in that psalm, it says this. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way, and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. Though its waters roar and foam, and the mountains quake with their surging. I was thinking about that. You know, that describes uh, uh, just a, a natural disaster that would come upon the earth. And in spite of that, God is saying that you could have peace, that you could be still and know that he is God. And I was just thinking about how just in uh, the last several years, uh, since the turn of the century, think of the things that we have experienced. We experienced Hurricane Katrina, which uh, took uh, over 1,800 lives. And it cost over $81 billion that disaster back in 2005. And then uh, in 2011, we saw the, the, the tsunami and earthquake that hit Japan. And that took uh, close to 20,000 lives. And um, that uh, was the largest uh, economic uh, disaster recorded in history, $235 billion worth of damage. I mean, that earthquake and tsunami was so powerful, the island of Honshu, the largest island in Japan, it, it moved eight feet. That entire island of Honshu moved eight feet. That's how strong that disaster was. And then just this year, we experienced on our eastern seaboard Hurricane Sandy, and that cost $50 billion of damage. We have seen just in uh, the last several years these incredible natural disasters. The mountains are shaking. The seas are roaring all around us. And yet there's an offer of peace. In uh, verse 6 of Psalm 46, it speaks of political people. It says, nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. Again, just in the, these last, uh, since the, the turn of the millennium, we've seen an upheaval politically as well. We're all too familiar with the events of what happened on 9-11-2001 and the political upheaval of that, that that caused. We see military conflicts, the Gulf War, the war in Iraq, the war in Afghanistan. We are living in these days of political upheaval. We've seen the demise of, of uh, kingdoms, kings and kingdoms, just in these last few years. Those who are in uh, leader, leadership have been up, uh, uprooted. Osama bin Laden, he was on the uh, most wanted list for 13 years, and he, his reign of terror came to an end. Saddam Hussein, he's, he was in power for 24 years, and just not that long ago, his reign of terror came to an end. Hosni Mubarak in Egypt, he reigned for 31 years, and we've just seen his reign come to an end. Muammar Gaddafi in Libya, 42 years, and now his reign has come to an end. All of this just in the last several years, we've seen the nations in an uproar. We've seen kingdoms fall all around us, and yet God offers us 
We've seen in our own life, we've gone through this economic recession. From 2008 to even today, some look at it as this extended period of economic recession. And we don't even speak of the personal struggles and challenges that we all face. The loss of a loved one, the loss of a marriage, the worries that we have for our children and their future, all of these challenges that we face. The nations are shaking. The world is shaking. Our very lives can be shaken. And yet God says, be still. Be still and know that I am God. There's this divine connection between stillness and knowing. What does it mean, though, to be still? What does that mean? Be still. In one translation of the Bible, in the NASB, it says, cease striving. We're called to cease striving. We're called to not rely on our own strength, but to, in a sense, relax. Allow God to be God. Don't go about life in a way that we think that it's all about us. It's all about our efforts. We place our hope and trust that God, He is in control. Now, sometimes we get confused about this because when it tells us to be still or when it tells us not to strive, we think, okay, great. And we equate that with being lazy or being um, passive, but that's not what it means. God never calls us to be lazy or passive. In fact, the Bible has a pretty dim view about people who are lazy. And he says, look at the ant. We can learn from the ant and how industrious the ant is. And so it's not a call to be lazy. To be still and to be lazy are very different. To be still and to be passive is very different. Jesus himself was often very busy. He had a full schedule. And yet what's amazing was Jesus was never in a hurry. Jesus was never in, in, in a state of mind and in a state of, of his own heart, a condition of his heart where he was so uh, frantic that he couldn't love. Jesus could have a very busy schedule, but he wasn't in a hurry. He loved. He cared for people. He saw their need. There is a way of us living in this very busy society that we're in where we can still be still. We can still connect with God. We can still respond in the right way with the right kind of love, with the right kind of heart. Because he calls us, he calls us to, to be still. See, it really does come down to, are we trusting in God? Do we trust in God? So to be still, what does that mean for a student? Does that mean that they stop studying and trust God for their grades? I don't think so. What does it mean to trust God financially? Does that mean you stop investing and you just say, well, I'm going to trust God? I don't necessarily think so. What does it mean for a parent to trust God with their children's future? Does it mean you stop giving guidance and counsel to your children and just say, well, I'm just going to trust God? I think what it means is that we do what God calls us to do, but ultimately we trust that God is going to do only what he can do. We place our trust in him, in his capability, in his vision. What did the pastor he, gave, he uh, shared this insight that has always stuck with me. 
And he was wrestling with this dilemma of how uh, he would draw closer to God, but there was this vicious cycle that would happen in his own life. And he would draw closer to God, but in the midst of drawing closer to God and, and getting connected with him, he seemed like uh, the result would be that he would fall into the, the, the trap of pride. It was, it was odd that he would feel closer to God, but in the midst of getting closer to God, he would feel proud about being closer to God, and he would start looking at other people, and he would say, you know what, they, if they were just as committed as I was, if they were just as serious as I was about their own faith, they would then uh, experience what I've experienced. And then he would notice, that's just a prideful heart. And he just saw this vicious cycle of drawing close to God, but then walking in pride until the Lord showed him and gave him this insight. And the Lord showed him and he said to him, don't, uh, don't look at yourself as such a great follower. Recognize the fact that I'm a great leader. That insight, that it wasn't so much about him being a great follower of God, it was that God was such a great and awesome leader of his life. And that sort of shifted everything. And when I read that, that really helped me as I think about how is it that we could be still and know that God is God, that he's in control. How did, what does that look like in the midst of our parenting? Our finances? What does that look like in the midst of just life? I was uh, talking to one of my kids this week, and uh, we got to this great conversation, and uh, we were talking about uh, their future and whether or not. I was worried about the future. Um, and I, I, I had a chance to just share this because um, because of the insight that I had received from this, uh, this other pastor, uh, it's really helped me a lot. Because as a parent, I want to do all that I can to raise my kids in the way I, I believe God wants me to raise them. But ultimately, I don't trust that somehow it's going to be dependent on my parenting. Ultimately, my trust is in how much God loves my kids. I think that's what it means in 1 John 4. 1 John 4, 16 says, And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. We rely on the love God has for us. When you are still, you begin to reflect upon how much God loves us. And we put less trust in our own abilities, whether it be parenting, where it's our financial acumen, whether it's uh, just being our relational skills, we put less trust in that. And we put our trust squarely on the Lord. I want to share with you um, some practical things I believe we could do to be still today. How do you live this out on a daily basis? The first thing, and I, I just want to say this in terms of just specific words that I want us to capture. And the first, uh, the first word or phrase is slow down. Slow down. We could all benefit from slowing down. Uh, Eugene Peterson wrote a Bible, or a paraphrase of the Bible called The Message. And in this uh, paraphrase, this is the way he translates Isaiah 46.10. He says, step out of the traffic. Take a long, loving look at me, your high God, above politics, above everything. Step out of the traffic. I like that. You and I are called to step out of that fast life. 
Slow down. Uh, in his book, uh, The Life You've Always Wanted, John Orford, he uh, has a chapter entitled The Unhurried Life. And so really, it's a wonderful uh, understanding of how we're called to just slow down. He says um, in, in this uh, chapter, hurry is not just a disordered schedule. Hurry is a disordered heart. Hurry is not just a disordered schedule. Hurry is a disordered heart. And he goes on to say that if we are always in a hurry, we will fail to love people because we can't love people in a hurry. Loving people takes time. Connecting with God takes time. And we have to slow down in order to uh, allow the roots of our faith to go deeper with God. I had a friend, a good friend, he cracked me up. Uh, he, uh, he wanted to cram in more things into his life. He's an avid reader, so he would listen to uh, books, uh, audio books, while he was driving. But he wouldn't just listen to the books, he would speed up the, the, uh, the recording so that he could listen faster, so he could get through more books. And I was just thinking about that. Like, what would that sound like? Speeding up the, the, uh, the voice recorder so that you could listen faster. It's like, it's like exchanging, you know, the deep, rich voice of like a James Earl Jones, right? And you start listening to books to Alvin the Chipmunk, you know? <laughs> It's all for just to try to get more in. That's the kind of society we live in. We want to cram more in. Because more is better. Faster is better. And yet I think God invites us to be still. Slow down. Know that I am God. I was thinking about preaching this message. <laughs> but you would not be tracking with me. The second word is quiet. Quiet. Time. I think it's interesting how we use that phrase to describe a time with God, usually a daily time, or just a regular time with God. And some wise person coined the term quiet time. I think that's so descriptive. Because we set aside time to be quiet. Do you notice that in order for you to hear, you have to be quiet. In fact, oftentimes, for people who are married or within families, the problem is, is that there no one's listening. You have people talking and people waiting to talk, but no one's listening. And in a quiet time. It's an opportunity for us to allow God to speak to us. Whether it's through the word or through prayer or just our focused thoughts that we're creating space so that God could speak to us and remind us he is God and we are not. When we fail to be quiet, something weird happens. We become God, and God is God. We become the God of our own life. We think it's all dependent on us, and we begin to take on the pressure and the weight of the world, and somehow 
in our own hearts, we seek the Lord. And that's why we have people who live with this constant anxiety, constant fear, constant feeling like life is out of control. When God invites us to be still, set aside that quiet time with God. Make it daily. If you can't do it daily, make it regular. But set aside that time with the Lord. One of the big mistakes we make, though, when we set aside that time, we go, I'm going to make a commitment to spending quiet time with God. How many of us have made commitments to spend quiet time with God? And then what happens is we don't feel like it. And then we use this rationalization. We say, well, I know God really wants me to have a right heart. I don't have a right heart, therefore I'm not going to spend the quiet time that I committed to make. And we sabotage our own life with the Lord. Instead, a better approach is to go, you know what? I made a commitment to spend this time with God. My heart's not in it. I'm going to talk to him about it. I'm going to, when I meet with him, I'm going to say, God, I don't feel like being here. Sometimes it feels like you're not listening to me, God. I'm going to be authentic in my speaking to God, but I'm also going to stay true to the commitment I've made to Him. And in the process, I believe that God will begin to change our heart. That God will begin to meet us in that place where we're crying out to Him. We're asking Him, God, I need to hear from you. God, I want you so badly. Quiet time. It's so simple. It's so necessary for the Christian to have a depth in their soul and a perspective on life. And yet, oftentimes, we, we neglect them. I feel that at times. I'd rather get to all the things that are on my to-do list. And uh, it's a real, sometimes, strain just to put those things aside and to spend that quiet time with God. And I'm a pastor. I get paid to do that kind of stuff. And sometimes it can be hard. But in the process, I've also found that when I've um, joined with others, when I've been accountable to others, it's really helped me. See, I kind of think, I kind of make it sound like I'm helping them, they're helping me, that's the big secret. But I love meeting with other people. And uh, I would encourage you to do the same. If you can't meet with other people, give other people permission to ask, you, hey, what has God been showing you? How's your time with God been? Have you been spending some good time with the Lord? Give people that permission to ask you questions like that. Accountability. You know what accountability is? Accountability is asking people the tough questions today that God will ask someday. Accountability is asking people the tough questions today that God will ask someday. And we could walk alongside one another and, and do this together to encourage one another because we all need to be still and to know that He is God. The third word that uh, I think is important is Unplug. Unplug. Unplugging can be, in our society, a wonderful way of carving out that time and space so that we are given this uninterrupted opportunity to commune with God. 
turn it on. Whether it's the music that you like to listen to, whether it's the TV, whether it's the radio, whatever it might be, learn to turn it off. Start with just five minutes. I know for some of us that feels like an eternity when you're just alone with your thoughts, just you and God. But just begin to turn it off and unplug and allow the Lord to meet you in the silence. Sometimes we feel like we're so lost unless there's music or noise or things happening all around us. And yet, when we choose to unplug, we're creating some space for God then to begin to speak to us and for us to listen to Him. Go for a walk. Go for a walk. Go for a walk without the headphones. Just walk and talk. Last week, I was practicing this uh, in my car as I just was driving along, and I was talking with God. I turned off the radio and just talked with God, and we were having this wonderful dialogue. And he was speaking uh, to me even as I was speaking to him. And this great sense of his presence, his, his, uh, his heart started coming through as, as, as I allowed the quietness to settle into my own soul. Uh, Ophelia, today she read the Advent passage out of Luke 1 um, and at the very end, verse 79. And uh, that passage speaks of, of how uh, there is a path. It, it talks about, it says, guide our feet into the path of peace. Guide our feet into the path of peace. That there is a peace, that the Messiah came to offer us peace. And there's a pathway to peace that God wants us to take. The question is, will we walk? Will we slow down? Will we have that quiet time with God? Will we choose to unplug? And that path to be quiet will lead us right into the peace that he has offered us. Today, um, as we are celebrating Advent, God's offering you, especially those who are filled with anxiety, you're anxious, you're worried about your future, He's offering you peace. We want to invite you to come and receive prayer today. Uh, we're going to ask uh, those who want to, who are available to intercede to uh, go to your stations. And um, during these next few moments, this could be a great time for you just to lift up your cares to God. Maybe it's uh, you'd want to just pray that uh, you would be able to spend that quiet time with God on a more regular basis. Sometimes it's good to receive prayer for those types of things. Um, in, in receiving prayer, there's a little bit of accountability in that as well, which is a good thing. So um, if you could, uh, I'm gonna ask you to stand right now. Let's all stand. I'm gonna ask those who are in the seating to go to the prayer station. And I'm gonna pray for us right now. Lord, we stand in honor of you. Lord God, we thank you that you give us and lead us into the pathway of peace. Lord, in the midst of a busy society, in the midst of a very busy time, uh, during this holiday season, your invitation still stands to be still and to know that you are God, that you are in control. That though the nations are in an uproar, though there may be natural disaster, though there may be personal challenges that we're facing, that you are God. And that you will be exalted amongst the nations. You choose and are working out 
events so that you would be exalted in the earth. God, help us to remove ourselves from the thrones of our own minds and hearts. Help us, God. Help us to come and be still. Help us to quiet ourselves. Help us to carve out the time. Thank you that we have this time right now to be still before you. To cast all our anxieties upon you because you care for us. Thank you, Lord. Meet us now. May we express the very things that are on our heart as we worship you and as we receive prayer. In Jesus' name.